So my brother and I grew up in a part of Bombay, India, called Marine Drive, and specifically the part Chopati Beach, which was right across the Arabian Sea. So this is a picture of Chopati Beach, taken from our first floor balcony. So this is the view we got to see. But this is really different from other beaches you may be familiar with. For instance, this is peak daytime, but the beach is completely empty. And there's a good reason for that. In India, almost all throughout the year, especially in Bombay, it's just too hot to go to the beach during the day. So that's why the beach would be completely empty during the day. But in contrast, at night, you'd see thousands of people. Thousands of people, and this is just a random Thursday night one month ago. Thousands of people there, and the main attraction was food. So you can imagine car horns honking, street vendors calling, a lot of people, noise, musical instruments, families from all over the city of Bombay, and this is not a small city, so 20 million people, families from all over the city come to the beach at night to enjoy the street food. And there was a sort of intimacy in these gatherings, despite the huge amounts of people. And the beach stretched on for quite a bit. So this is just one, uh, one spit of land. So there was some really good food. And we didn't realize it growing up there, my brother and I, but we were in the epicenter of street food culture for all of India. It all originated here, and some of the most innovative things were being done right here on this beach. So for example, there was pao bhaji. Pao bhaji is vegetables mashed together and served with buttered bread, but it's more than that. So you can imagine a griddle with flames underneath, a flat surface. And on that griddle, vegetables are tossed, usually leftovers from other food. But um, a potato masher was used, so potatoes, peas, cauliflower, and a whole medley of different spices were added together. And as the heat is spitting out from underneath, they're constantly mashing these vegetables. And then they add it to heavily buttered pillow soft bread. And you use this bread to mop up the vegetable mixture and then eat it. So it's spice all in one. After that, you may settle for pani puri, which is a really famous dish that's served on this beach. Pani puri is a shell around this size, and it's a fried crispy shell. And you crack the shell open on the top, you add spiced chickpeas to it, and maybe some other crunchy bits. And then you take that whole shell and you dip it in a vat of really cold, icy, tangy tamarind water. That's the best way to describe it. And so the water fills the crevices where the chickpeas didn't get, and it's all in one bite. You pop it in your mouth and there's an explosion. So you get the contrast between the hot, spicy chickpeas, the cool, sour tamarind water, and it's a really good explosion in your mouth. You gotta try it at least once. So after that, you would go for something sweet to kind of cool yourself down. So we had this famous stall on the beach. They served kulfi, and on the top you can see the colors, the different varieties, the flavors, all available. It was very colorful food. Kulfi is a cousin of ice cream. It's a frozen treat made by reducing milk and sugar, and oftentimes fruit or different spices together. So imagine taking milk and cooking it down till it's almost half the original volume. And then you'd pour it hot into molds and the molds would be frozen. And then when it's pulled out of the mold, it's so dense and creamy and thick that it has to be actually cut with a sharp knife and then served on a plate with a spoon. So that was kulfi. And then another, oftentimes in addition to kulfi, you could go for my favorite thing at the beach, which was masala milk. Now masala milk is born out of Indians' love for dairy. So India as a country is the world's largest dairy consuming country per capita. So Indians love dairy. Uh, masala milk, for example, is milk that's cooked with spices. Now these are warm spices, not spicy spices, but warm spices that accentuate the sweet flavor of the milk. So you'd have cardamom, you'd have nutmeg, you'd have saffron, um, all these spices, cinnamon sometimes as well, cooked together. And there was a version of this milk called badam milk that you got to try the ice cream version of. 
but badam milk was almonds cooked with saffron and cardamom and served in the milk and usually served hot. So these were some of the favorite street foods that we had in India. But around age 12, we moved to Atlanta, my brother and I, along with our family. And uh, my mom tried to recreate some of these favorite flavors of ours that we had in India. And one of them was called Sheer Kurma. It was a more advanced version of this milk, but it also had basil seeds inside and it had vermicelli. So it would be served in a tall glass with a spoon and served hot. And this was using my grandmother's original recipe back in Bombay. But as you can tell, uh, this recipe was very complex. It was labor intensive. It took a lot of time, effort. You had to dry. The, the recipe called for taking the almonds that would go into the milk and drying them in the sun for a couple days to create the exact perfect crispy airy texture that my grandmother liked. And so as you can understand, we would only experience this maybe once or twice a year. But that was enough to create a longing for more. So fast forward to business school, my brother and I are at Emory, and we decide, hey, you know, why not bottle that milk, that same recipe, put it in bottles, and take it out to the marketplace? Why not? Let's see if the world is ready for these kind of uh, flavors, and put it on the shelf and see what happens. For example, this is a kulfi to show you the density of the texture. So we were doing a lot of food experiments at this time, trying to hone in on what we were good at and what would be acceptable. So this was our early trials of badam milk that we made. It was no surprise that it was really delicious, right? We were just using our grandmother's recipe. There was no science to it, and that was probably uh, a problem later on. But there was no science, we just make the thing, put it in the bottle, and have our friends try it. And they liked it. So we said, hey, we could do this. But the problem arose after three or four days when this entire batch got spoiled. So we realized fresh milk, once you add stuff to it, you, add, you cook it further, the shelf life is reduced, and you can't really put this product out there because it's going to go spoiled really fast. So we had a discussion with our dad. It was, in our heads, not a crisis, but we were trying to figure out, like, where do we go from here? We can't obviously take this product to the market. What do we do? So he explained to us at this point that um, we were, in fact, trying to build a brand. And we would have to brand this product, and customers would have to see the product on the shelf. They would have to purchase it. They would have to like it, and they would have to repurchase it. That's the cycle for building a brand. And we wouldn't be able to do this in three days, given the shelf life of this product. So we'd have to look for another idea. Along this same time, I'm in MBA at Emory, and a project comes to us, our yearly project from Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola comes to our MBA class and says, you guys know Starbucks have launched a really successful ready-to-drink coffee, the Frappuccinos in the bottle, and also then their lattes, and it's all over. We want to compete with Starbucks because Starbucks was being distributed by PepsiCo. So we need to be in that space. So Coca-Cola said, we have a really popular brand in Europe, and we're going to bring it to the US, but we need to adapt this brand to the US customers' taste and preferences. So that's your task. You need to rebrand it. And you have two months, and then come back, and we'll pick a winner, and you get to present to our board. Our MBA class was divided into several groups. Each group had five people. And within our groups, we were given specific tasks. My job was to redesign the outer packaging for Illy Coffee that was coming to the US. So this was, we didn't know it at that time, but this was a really great exercise in brand building. So I got to learn what customers wanted, what were Illy's strengths, what was Starbucks' strengths, and how to put it across to the customers in a way that was appealing to them. So on the left side, you can see the three filled bottles. That is my design for Illy Coffee, the redesign. On the right, the empty bottle, was Coca-Cola's version that they were trying to transfer over. So we simplified the packaging, branded it very strong, because if it was a new brand, we wanted people to recognize it first. 
The white background was so it could absorb the lights from the freezer shelf or the cooler shelf and attract the customers. And then simplify it by saying espresso plus milk on the top. And although we didn't win the overall competition, this brand, this packaging, won the first place in packaging design. So I was selected to go and talk to Coca-Cola. And uh, we presented to Coke, and they really liked it. They especially liked the Italian stripe on the top, which nodded back to Illy's Italian heritage. They liked that idea. It would differentiate from Starbucks. And after this, I said, wow, that's really cool. I got a chance to do this, and I was full of confidence. I said, if I can present and I can do something that Coca-Cola listens to, why stop there? So as often, I would sit and talk with my brother, and we came up with the idea, very silly now looking back at it, but at that time we thought it was really cool. We could redesign the coffee inside of it as well. So we started experiments with coffee. <laughs> So the first step was to understand how to brew coffee. So we went to Home Depot, we got a bunch of parts, we took over our parents' basement, and we built a brewing apparatus there. And because we didn't want to cook on open flames or anything, we settled on a cold brewing process. So it would, the coffee would drip through the brew overnight, and it would drip into a container. And in the morning, we would get up and we would bottle this coffee. We would pour it very slowly into bottles, seal it up, and then take it to class in the evenings and set one on the tables of students taking an exam. So it caught on. Uh, people liked the coffee. Uh, there were emails coming to us saying, hey, you should stock up the cooler in the common area with some coffee. Students love the coffee. And uh, so we thought we were flying high. But then again, my brother brought sense back into me. He sat me down and said, there's a few things wrong with this. One is the coffee is really bad. Um, people are only having it for the caffeine content, and you're giving it out at exam time. So who's going to say no to like caffeine? And the second is, if we can make this coffee in our basements, what is stopping anybody else from doing it, or somebody who's bigger than us from doing it, and doing it better or cheaper than us, they'll just take over any market share that we're able to build. And so I learned my first lesson in differentiation. This coffee was not differentiated. It would not survive in the marketplace. We were bringing nothing unique and nothing of value to the market. So we were back at the drawing board. But it, uh, again, it seemed like a mini crisis, but it only lasted one day. The idea clicked back that we could go back to those roots, those flavors that we grew up with at Chopati Beach, and translate it into ice cream. At this stage, we begin making the milk into ice cream. My first task was that same night, a fire was lit under me, and I wanted to have, I self-imposed a deadline. I wanted to have an ice cream trial done by that night. So with that kind of silly thinking, you're only going to end up at one place. So I went to Food Network's website. <laughs> I got the easy three-ingredient vanilla ice cream, no-cook version. And I started making it. There were some uh, mishaps in the kitchen and everything. It went late night. But I wanted to show something to my parents that night itself. By the time my brother and I had finished that experiment, it was well past midnight. My parents were asleep. But I went, woke them up, got them to try the ice cream. <laughs> I remember my dad trying the bite, and he didn't say it, but you could see it wasn't good. Um, at this point, he explained to me one very important thing. He said, if you want to make ice cream, you got to respect the people that made ice cream before you and go learn how to make ice cream. And that was it. So the next day, I looked up ways to learn how to make ice cream. And I settled on a dairy science school at Cornell because I realized I had to make, I learn how to do dairy before I could do ice cream. I decided to dual enroll. So I was at Emory and I went back and forth with Cornell and I would do the practical hands-on stuff for ice cream and dairy science over there and do the business stuff. But I felt I was really finally getting to somewhere. Like I could take the practicality of the MBA and the hands-on learning from the ice cream and put it together. So we started experimenting with ice cream. We did some experiments. 
Our first flavor was badam milk, which was a recreation. We already had a sort of understanding of how we wanted it to taste. So our first challenge was to come up with a space. Uh, USDA wants a space within a space, a clean room to do so. And we looked at contractors, and contractors gave us ridiculous quotes. And so again, my brother and I put our heads together and we said, we've come this far, we can't let this stop us from making ice cream. We've got to figure out a way to make a space. Let's build it ourselves. And so I say, Rehan, we don't know how to build anything. We've never built anything other than Lego. <laughs> and he says, let's look at getting Lego bricks in then. And the internet is a wonderful place. We were able to find somebody that made giant Lego bricks. And if we had asked our inspector beforehand to approve of our plan to make a Lego production room, they would have said, no way. But we went ahead and did it anyway. And if you guys get a chance and come out and see our factory in Stone Mountain, you'll attest that this is a very structurally safe place. Uh, it is complete with doors and windows, but we hand built an entire production room of 800 square feet out of Lego, and we were off to the races. So we started making ice cream. We took our first steps. Uh, we designed our packaging based on those colors and those influences from Chopati Beach. The name for the company was very easy. Our last name is Bhivandiwala, so we picked Ice Cream Wala, which translates to a seller of ice cream. And the logo was the push cart where kulfis were sold in. So it all started coming together very well. And even though this seemed like the first time spices were being added to ice cream, it just seemed familiar to us. And we knew when that familiarity came about that we were on the right track. So we built a range of flavors to complement this one and to showcase the flavors of our childhood. And we started producing ice cream. So our first batch, doesn't look like much, but this was our first batch of production in one rack in our freezer, and then we packaged it in boxes. We took it in our car, and we started having people in stores and restaurants try it and trying to get orders from there. And from that little step, now one year later where we stand today, our ice cream is available in 15 states. We have 12 different flavors. We sell to restaurants, to specialty grocery stores, and soon we're starting online. But this isn't the story about, oh, thank you. So this really isn't the story about Ice Cream Wala, which is starting from this point onwards. This is the story of how we took everything around us and found a medium to express our creativity and put it together in a package that would be greater than the sum of its parts. And, that's the moral. We want you to find a medium to express yourself and to create something. So that's the story. Thank you for trying the ice cream. Thank you. Thank you.